Okay, so um, now we're going to do the ovaries. Um, still gonads. Um, you will see lots and lots of similarities between ovarian uh, hormone regulation and testicular hormone regulation because remember, they are um, homologous structures. They are the same embryonic structure that develops in two different hormonal environments. So it's going to be basically slight, slight deviation from the thing that you learned um, in the male hormones as far as, as far as the regulation mechanism. Okay, so let's talk about estrogens and progesterone and remind you where they fit into this story. So these were the androgens collectively, and these three are the estrogens. Um, estradiol is the big one, but collectively those three are called estrogens and they're in different concentrations than each other, but we're going to lump them together mostly. Okay, so... Um, and then we have progesterone. So let's talk about estrogen's function first, and then we'll talk about um, progesterone in just a second. Okay, so the estrogens are responsible for um, female development and um, the development of what we call the female secondary sex characteristics. So um, estrogens need to be present during um, fetal development in order for the female ducts um, to continue their development into the um, uterine tubes or oviducts and um, the, the uterus. Um, so those are primary sex characteristics in female development. Secondary sex characteristics are the things that change in um, a girl as she goes through puberty. So you have breast development, you have an increase in height, you have a change in body fat deposition, um, body fat deposition starts to go around the hips and the legs primarily and in the breast. Um, and um, you have axillary hair growth and pubic hair growth. And then um, you also have the maturation of the female reproductive tract, which can make the woman reproductively viable. So in addition, estrogens are necessary for the female reproductive cycle, just like androgens were necessary for the male reproductive cycle. Remember, you needed not just FSH, but also androgens in order to do spermatogenesis. Um, in females, you will need not just FSH, but also estrogens in order to do oogenesis. And we're going to draw this in just a second. So this figure right here is sort of a complicated version. Don't worry about it too much because I'm about to draw it and I'm going to simplify it for you. But I do want to tell you one thing that's important. And that is that we um, women... Um, people with um, ovaries and a uterus um, will make androgens first and then convert them into estrogens, okay? Males make androgens and don't do as much estrogen conversion. And that's all that this part is showing here, but I'm gonna simplify it when I draw it for you. But basically um, you make androgens and then you convert them into estrogens, okay? So that's just a little aside. I don't expect you to draw it this way. I'm going to show you how to draw it. It's not actually going to be that hard. So basically, it's going to be a variation of what we drew, drew already when we were looking at um, the male reproductive tract. And then we'll come back and get progesterone after we do this. So same thing we did last time. Let us, and there's a place in your notes just below to draw this if you want to draw it down there it's going to be variations on the same theme. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do oogenesis and um, estrogen secretion, okay? So um, what organ do we start with when we are regulating um, reproductive hormones, um, sex hormones, um, hypothalamus? It releases what relevant hormone, that's GnRH, GnRH goes to the same place it always goes, which is the anterior pituitary. And then you release two hormones in response to that. You release luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Good. And luteinizing hormone goes to, this time we're gonna go to the ovaries. Again, same embryological structure, ovaries. And it's different cells in the ovaries. I don't make you learn the names of the cells, but that's why they do different things in response to different hormones. And then the ovaries in response to luteinizing hormone are going to produce estrogens. And really, although I don't want to draw it in here because it makes it too messy, what they do is produce androgens and then convert them into estrogens. And then in response to FSH, the ovaries are going to do oogenesis which is basically basically the production of an egg. 
if estrogens are present. Okay, so you need estrogens and FSH in order to do oogenesis. Okay, so a couple of things. It's going to be pretty much the same. How do you know that you just actually um, matured um, an egg and you don't need to do another one for a minute? An oocyte, actually. You actually release inhibin. And inhibin goes back to the anterior pituitary and says, I'm cool on FSH right now. You don't need to make any more. Okay. And then what about how do you know when you made enough estrogen and you can chill out on the estrogen for a little while? Well, estrogen being lipid soluble because it's a steroid goes back to both the anterior pituitary and because it's lipid soluble, it can get through the blood brain barrier and go to the hypothalamus, which says that's enough estrogen for right now. So it's pretty much a variation on the same story. So where are the differences? I'm sure you can see them. They're not that hard, but let me find them for you. Basically, ovaries and oogenesis instead of testes and spermatogenesis. Ovaries and estrogen instead of um, testes and androgens. Other than that, it's pretty much the same story. Okay, Ooh, big fly. Um, okay, so um, we did inhibin. We got him. Come back to relax, and in just a second, I want to tell you just a little bit about progesterone. I'm not going to make you learn the feedback mechanism for progesterone because it's kind of complicated, but I do want you to know what it does um, because there's going to be something clinical that will relate to progesterone. So notice that progesterone is not part of this little story of the male hormones and then convert them into the estrogens. It is over here by itself, okay? Still a pink hormone, and it's actually interestingly a precursor to some non-sex related hormones at all. Um, so this is progesterone. Now, before you get any further, I want you to listen to the name of that hormone, progesterone. It's progestation. So what progesterone is really doing, get over there, is, let's see if I can get it to do it. Okay, so what progesterone is going to do is the ovaries are going to make progesterone primarily in response to estrogen, but you don't have to know that part. And what um, the ovaries are going to do is to release progesterone into the bloodstream. And progesterone is progestation. So what it's doing is it's the ovaries using progesterone to tell the uterus what to do. Okay. It is responsible for telling the uterus that uh, an implantation could be coming. Okay because once I actually mature and ovulate um, an oocyte, then fertilization could occur right here, usually in that portion of the uterine tube, okay? Um, and then if that occurs, then you could have the possibility of um, a fertilized oocyte that starts moving down and becomes um, implanted, but only if the lining of the uterus is ready for implantation. So about the time that you start getting ready for ovulation, your progesterone levels are going to rise. And this is actually really complicated. I'm super oversimplifying it, but just let me do it this. So your progesterone levels are going to rise and the ovary is going to tell the uterus to increase the thickness of the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, and more blood flow, more thickness in the endometrium to make it hospitable to a possible implantation. So, um, what happens is the progesterone level stays um, high and the uterine lining stays thick for a window around ovulation. And then after you get out of that window, an implantation, which is how pregnancy is defined, has not occurred, then what's going to happen is the progesterone level is going to drop and that's what causes menstruation. So progesterone level goes up, says maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to get an implantation and a pregnancy, and then it doesn't implant, and then the progesterone level drops, and then you menstruate, and then you do the whole thing over again during the next cycle. So that's progesterone's job. It's progestation. If, however, an implantation did occur, your progesterone le level would stay high throughout the entire pregnancy. If it was a normal, typical, healthy pregnancy, progesterone level stays high the whole time. It's supporting the pregnancy. Okay, one last thing is that also only during childbirth 
Um, the ovaries actually produce one more hormone and that is called relaxin. And only during birth or parturition do they produce this hormone that actually relaxes um, the ligaments and tendons and muscles of the pelvic girdle to make parturition or birth easier. Um, some women, I didn't feel this, but I didn't go through a normal delivery. I had a planned cesarean section. But um, some women say that like relaxin feels like all your joints are loose and it makes it feel like if you threw a ball, your arm would go with it. And maybe you guys can tell me in class if you've experienced that, if you want to share. Okay, so can you reconstruct the chain of hormone secretion that begins with the hypothalamus and ends with oogenesis and estrogen projection? Um, production, you can because we just did. Okay, that's what that is. And um, the feedback mechanism for estrogen, what is feeding back? It's hormones. It's inhibiting the hormone feeding back to stop oogenesis. And it's actually the estrogens themselves feeding back to stop estrogen secretion. Okay, couple more disorders. And that is, um, I want to talk briefly about how, actually, no, let me stop here. I'll do the disorders in the next one.